All right, so today we are going to be working on a project that is probably going to be one of our most used things ever in this world, especially for all these types of components right here. As you can see, they aren't really build too much to be sort of, you know, especially chests and everything like that. Uh, slime we got plenty of. This one's not going to be so much with that one or slime, but mainly these components here that we use so much on a server like this especially a majority of these ones over here, which is why we have them very much in the front of our chest hall here. That way they're easily accessible for us to do. And if we need to craft anything along those lines, we can also do that very easily because those items are also in reach as well. Yes, yeah, so we do have some in the bulk over here, like, you know, redstone itself, blocks of redstone, uh, you know, mainly a lot, a lot of pistons and sticky pistons we have, but not too many of the other ones. We definitely need to get a bunch of those for, as you can see, I think completely out of D&D, &D, but this perimeter may sort of help, may sort of not. Uh, with the TNT itself, this could be used, definitely gonna be using a lot of TNT with the overworld and nether side of it. Um, but it'll just mainly help us get a lot of these materials in large quantities pretty, pretty easily without having to go to different farms all over the place to get the materials. We're gonna farm everything in one area even for the difficult ones like comparators and observers because you do need some quartz for that so uh yeah we'll get over there I'm gonna finish the perimeter off we have it fully decorated based off a video a long time ago where i showed uh actually decorating that perimeter with the perimeter printer which we use there and a small other thing we're gonna need to do is we're gonna have to get some sort of way to get the sand over to that perimeter. So we gotta gotta pick a location, which we did, close enough to here. That way we can transport sand to craft TNT with the gunpowder that we're gonna be farming there. That way we also get that automatically as well. We don't gotta worry about uh, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, and then, yeah, that's obviously just easy to access here. And it's not always loaded, which is a good thing. And then this also allows us now that, you know, wasn't something I thought about. We can take the sand from here and move it to a different place very, very efficiently and quickly. So we have a little thing down here that'll dispense them with that no clock in the center there. That gets them all down here to where they are sent on a dropper line to go to our location. It goes down and then it'll go back over to the perimeter. So uh, yeah, everything's all good here. Time to actually get the perimeter started. That way we can actually start crafting a bunch of redstone components. So let's get to it. All right, so we got one of the farms completely built up. Now I say one of the farms technically is two because we did add a uh, obsidian uh, portal XP farm on top here to obviously get XP to repair the, the uh, pickaxe that we'll be using here for the stone farm, which of course is the idea. I might need to decrease the amount of snowmen in there because it seems like some of them are just getting constantly knocked back. Uh, so let's go see if we can do that. Slight modification with the portals above. It's really just straightforward, simple, uh, compared to the one that this is based off of with Fallen Breath for their 70k ice farm. Obviously, we don't need all of the stuff going up and down because we can just have the XP drop on top of the player's head here. And it uses the XP that it'll go right to it like that. And then over to the player. Now, we haven't really tested this out, but this is the same portal size as Fallen, so I guess we will see if we need to expand it a little bit more. We can go too much further with a single egg in the center, so we will see if we have to do anything. We'll have to go up higher, which isn't too bad. But uh, yeah, 70k stone farm. Obviously, we still need to attach a uh, collection at the back here, but just in that quick time explaining, we've got an over inventory of stone, so. Yeah, 72,000 stone per hour is pretty, pretty decent, and you really don't need more than that, uh, especially because it's very little lag on the server, so this could just basically be running indefinitely, provided that the XP is enough to sustain uh, that pickaxe there. But uh, yeah, so we'll test this out, see if we need a little bit more XP, we might. So I really didn't test the full farm up there, but I can say it's the same farm, same size as Fallen's uh, XP. The ice farm that they did it's a very very old ice farm but the portal layout worked really, really well for us so we're going to see if we can just make it a little bit different without the stuff going up and down 
and see how it goes. So this is one of seven farms I believe you need to do if you include the collection in the center. With this one over here, we have two more on each uh, corner there. So the, this is the this is the old one. That's the new one up there that we're going to be building. Where the portal is actually there. So we actually don't need that one anymore. We have an iron farm we're going to build, and the collection will be that's the killing chamber there. We're going to have Henrik's mob farm yet again, but we are going to modify it and just put trapdoors above. That way we only get spiders and creepers, which is what we need for this perimeter actually entirely. And then we have uh, another 2x2 truce tree farm. Uh, it's going to be a bit slower than the one we had before in the actual tree farm perimeter. We're also going to have a moss farm on top here to supply bone meal for this. That way this can also run indefinitely as well. And like I said, yeah, still a lot of stuff to attach to storages and things like that, but... We will get the farms built up first, then we'll work on the actual map, the crafter right in the center here. We'll go from there. The reason why we have this so high up is because we need to have a gold farm processing chamber underneath here. So we're going to have to uh, change it up a little bit, depending on if we want to use a single dimension or a dual dimension. So we will see. Of course, if we do change it and go to a single dimension, we can always lower this back down, which is why I'm saving this one for last due in case we decide to do it later or not. We actually need to build a cobblestone farm on top of the stone farm here. I forgot I moved that over. So yeah, and then we have the raid farm on that side over there. We still need to position, but... Uh, yeah, the reason why I built the stone farm one across from the raid farm one is so that these portals, even though no player is going to go through this, hopefully nothing will link to these ones, which is, of course, the main goal here. Of a bit of farms done now. Uh, so we still got one two, three, four, five farms to go, and then six if you include the... seven if you include the crafter here. I forgot about the cobblestone farm yet again, but uh, yeah, so we got a lot of farms to do. Let's continue grinding them out. All right, so with that, we have a another farm and a bit done here. We also have the cobblestone farm on top of the stone farm over there. Very, very simple and uh, pretty efficient cobblestone farm here by Just Luke. Uh, remember previously, I did build one of their cobblestone farms before, uh, but now this is the new and improved version, and it is a lot, a lot easier to build because there's not a lot, no water log stairs, things like that. That makes building this a lot easier to do. So I need to attach a storage somewhere, and then we're going to do something on top of this obsidian here, of course, to make it spawn proof, but also to fit the area here because it looks a bit weird to just have that on the floor there. And I don't know what we're going to do with the roof or the tree from over here yet, but we might not even need it because of starlight, but we shall see. We did it before with the other 2x2 two two spruce tree farm, so we probably will. As you can see here, we also have the moss farm right here. Uh, this is the Kronos moss farm is extremely lag efficient to run. Not to mention also pretty bone meal efficient. Uh, so yeah, the clock's down at the bottom here and then we have the bone meal up top. Uh, what this does is it uses stone generators up top here and then if it can, it'll pull it down and replace the moss down below, which is that being bone meal from down here, which will put the stone down here, it'll get bone mealed and turn into moss and then it repeats that cycle there very a very nice thing to look at what's not included is the in the schematic is this outside uh wrap around of the moss here but yeah that's hooked up to the air we have a little bit of a filter because occasionally you do get some uh moss based things in the output so just put a simple 2x filter here and it just spit that out and it goes hooked it up right to the bone meal input right here uh, i did run it obviously to refill everything here that way this is all good and then once it starts getting kicked up it will continue to keep up and actually overflow that uh because we needed something this produces around uses around 17,000 or 18,000 bone meal per hour uh each one of these little small little modules right here so this each door basically uh is 2,000 per hour so each one layer right here is 8,000 per hour which means we make 24,000 but you know, it is what it is. It's pretty simple to tile, so 
making it two by two and having an extra. It's always good to have uh, more than it is to have a little bit less. Uh, but yeah, so now I'm going to work on the villager breeders. That way we have the iron farm and the a raid farm left, which do require villagers. Not a lot, but I might just make one layer of that. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, then we also got to work on bringing over a, a pillager here. And I don't think we have any pillager outposts close by. Uh, pretty poor planning on my end, but maybe we'll see if there's anything relatively close. I could bring some villagers over from this village over here and make a breeder. Um, but yeah, I don't see any outposts nearby, which is not great. Uh, but I have done it before for the old raid farm. We have an extra evoker, but that's not going to help us in this situation. I think there's one over here that we used previously for the iron farm. Uh, but I would have to double check this area over here. I did completely get rid of the outpost, so we're not going to be relatively easily to see it on the map, but it, it's somewhere in this snowy biome area. Oh uh, yeah, so I work on that stuff now, um, and then we'll be back with some more progress. Alright, so we are in need of a few pillagers for the iron farm. I did capture three just in case we need an extra one. What we're going to do is I'm going to transport them all the way over to the farm area, which is that green little dot right there and that little beacon right there. What we actually needed these pillagers beforehand is actually this is the same portal I did before. We needed this for the iron farm. So you don't know that portal all the way up there as the chunk letters for our iron farm. And we used the old uh, mechanist one. We just had four pillars instead of the two. So we effectively got 64,000 an hour. Uh, 64,000 iron per hour as an output, but uh, yeah, so now we're going to use them for a different iron farm here. Just going to redirect these guys to go there instead. So obviously we're going to want to stay pretty decent distance away. Uh, smart thing would probably be to get their uh, bows, the crossbows out of their hands now, but that would be the smart thing to do, and we're going to do that later. So yeah. Actually, I'm going to sit here and remove their crossbows. All I'm going to do is just power them across the rail once they're done. That way it's a lot easier to actually handle them. So, uh, yeah, I will be back once they're actually inside the perimeter. Then getting them inside the farm if case you build the same farm that I do when this farm is released. Uh, once again, huge thank you for MD for giving this me for giving me access to this schematic early before their video was published on it. Uh, this definitely did help without with the whole process of actually getting everything inside of the perimeter and fully built and functional. So yeah, if you don't know how to actually do this, I'm just going to need a couple of slabs, which I don't actually have. So I will go over here, be right back, and we'll get these crossbows off of them. They are in a mine part, which makes it a little bit more difficult, so we may need to stand. I think a trapdoor actually works in our use case here uh, because they are basically sitting in a minecart. Yep, so with our case, them in the minecart, it is a trapdoor that works. Of course, if you are just having them stand up, a half slab is going to be a thing for you. I was doing for the third one, so yeah, this is what I'm going to do. Uh, so it will take quite a little bit for them to break the bows, but unlike skeletons, they can actually break them, which makes dealing with them a whole lot easier. So I'm going to sit here, and then we'll be back once the full iron farm is there. And then I'll also show you how to get the villagers in place for this specific iron farm, uh, as well as getting these guys in place. I will be back once it's all done. All right, so we got them both over here, and we're going to just take one into the, the, the chamber now. We take them on the top one first because I have the rail set up for that. It should probably help if I actually power this. There we go. Both pacified, so they're not going to be shooting at us, which makes moving them a lot, lot easier. 
which definitely does help, of course, which made sense for me to do it. Spend the extra 10 minutes just to sit there and wait for their crossbows to break. And then now moving them in here is pretty straightforward. So you should know you should be able to be broken out and you should only be able to land on that block. How do I know that? Well, there's no other uh, block that the guy can go to because it's either too high, like up here, or it has a rail on it and they don't prefer to go to the rails. Plus it is two blocks above, so they cannot exit out of that. The only available one is right where the mine park was. So now that that's there, this piston goes there. You should fully be in there and the note block to update the piston. You should just like that. One of them in there. Easy, easy. Now it's the other one down here. It is a bit lower. We'll use another rack here. That way I know what is actually the temporary block. You should be able to just drop them right onto this. Send them across, no need to extend the rail downwards. Make sure we block that off like that. Power it. And we should be good to go. Let me just turn this on to make sure that is correct. Just put back there. Like that, and we're fine. I do have the bows in here, the crossbows, these guys in here, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, either way, they will still work perfectly fine. Uh, but yeah, put the last guy in now, and then it's all about just moving the uh, villagers in, which is going to be a bit easier to do. Or. It'll be a bit more tedious to do because obviously there's three per chamber, um, but I have been having a villager reader go in the corner over there. So we should be stockpiling on some villagers for that. Obviously we need a lot more than what's probably there, but villagers just take time, which is pretty straightforward to do. So, all right, just like that, other guys in place, we can uh, place a block here because we are going to have to we can place it upwards. We're gonna have to push the block for this guy in place because you're not using a piston. Or I think that one actually goes there. Maybe we have to. Don't need to push a block. You just this. Yep. So we are good. This one. We don't need to block the revision off at all. We are good to go. Villages are all in place, just like that. That took maybe about a minute or two. Uh, pretty, pretty straightforward and now it's all time to get the villagers into those pods right there what I'm probably going to do is I'm probably going to break this dropper above and just drop them in maybe put a, an activator rail to get them out of the minecart automatically uh, that way they just fall straight down but we shall see so yeah I'll, once I get enough stuff ready to get one in I'll show that one off and then so you just repeat that for the whole time. So yeah, we don't need this anymore. So we can just go and break this all down and move on to the villagers. All right, so I got the track all hooked up for the villagers uh, for at least one cell. So we're gonna try to see if the, the activator rail is gonna put them on top of the trap door that I have placed there. Let's see, that should give us one villager. We're gonna do this one villager at a time, of course. So yes, people say villagers are pretty difficult to move. From my experience, I have built iron farms with over 500 villagers per. As long as you get a system and working, then it is smooth sailing and just repeating the pattern across the whole scale of the iron farm. So uh, yeah, I have quite a bit, probably over well over a thousand villagers being moved in just to just iron farms. So I'm pretty sure that it's just in the case of people not understanding how exactly they work and everything like that. So yeah, like being said, I forgot to put a block on top of there. So the villager 
sort of got put in a different location other than the one that I wanted him to originally go in. They are going to be attracted to the workstation, of course, so that's not ideal, but hopefully we can get him to move in the general area that we would like him to. So yeah, the activator rail, I believe doesn't seem like it's gonna be the functional thing. Uh, that would be worthwhile, as you can see, it didn't really stop anything. And mainly just the cart is now in predicament there. So I'm gonna lock him in. Uh, I'm gonna get some more. Actually, I have some here. If you were to do that, obviously you need to make sure that there are no other blocks for them to get onto. This one being the case right there with this trap door, I should be able to just drop him in just like that. So yeah, ideally you should be smart with it and encase everything the way it needs to. So we're actually going to block it off like that. I'll make a staircase like that for me. That is far enough away uh, to where they should only be going into, onto that trapdoor block or that one right there. The minecart will stop on the last other brick. So we'll do this one more time now that we actually have everything prepared properly. So yeah, uh, just going to hit the button again. We have a few villages here we should be able to get. I want to hopefully say about a quarter of the farm filled in here. This is only with one layer of villagers, so I might redirect two villagers up to the second, the first layer here. That way I can sort of kickstart the system and get exponential growth from it. Because not only do we need to fill the iron farm, we also need to fill in the raid farm, which is going to be in this area right here. So we will need a bit more villagers. Now the raid farm doesn't use that many, so that one won't be too bad to do. Um, but like I said, it is going to be a little bit different. We have that guy, we should be able to break the minecart. It's right there now, and then we can just open the trap door. And we have the second villager in place there. It seems as the first one did land on top of that, which is an easy fix. I just need to push them in just a little bit there. Should get rid of this redstone block, we don't need that anymore. Just gonna go down, push them over a little bit. That seems the other villager is full of should have been something I looked at uh, originally, obviously, but wasn't something I was paying too much attention to, so I'm going to try to hit them. And there it goes. Obviously, you don't like to do that if we can avoid it, but it is fine for this particular scenario. So, yeah, that's one more down. Let's going to do it for the last guy here. Obviously, the trapdoors in the pod make it a little bit more difficult because if they aren't full the way on the back of the block, then they will not do that. So something, something we could do here is we're going to push the villager all the way up against the back block here, getting them back in there, um, and then go from there. So what we're going to do is we're going to get them out of the minecart and just push them as far as you can into this block, uh, and then open the trap door. That way he just sort of just falls down there. It doesn't have a chance to uh, hopefully stay on top of that trap door again. This visual glitch with the minecart with the villagers has always been there, and I don't know exactly why it happens, but it does. Just a visual glitch, nothing to worry about. He's going to fight me here because he's probably got a path to the composter, which should be all the way up. We should probably switch this around. That way we don't run into that issue. Obviously, it's our last one for this one. So for the next one, we're going to put the trapdoor against here. I'm going to push them all the way up. Look at there, and they should fall right in. And then because of the trapdoors being online, they should not be able to uh, hit the next one. So yeah, all I did with this is I took out the one hopper that was here. So we have one hopper that's there. And then the um, poster on top of that. And that's what we're going to do for this one. I think this side's a bit different. Nope, it's the exact same. So what I'm going to break is this hopper and this composter. And then we're going to encase it. That way, the only way, the only spot available is right on top like that. 
Now it's just a case of connecting this, which I'm going to get more netherrack by breaking all of the other stuff on the other side. Um, and then it's just connecting the lines up, which is relatively straightforward. And we are good to go. So yeah, this is what we're doing for the next probably few hours, uh, including breeding time. So I might redirect two more up to there and the extra breeding cell. That way we can get a few more. I actually redirected this to the wrong one. I skipped a whole one, which we go into this one right here, uh, but that's pretty simple fix. So you know what to do, just in case it's all, that way the only block they can go out is either this one or they open the trap door, open the trap door and they fall down into their slot. They will take a bit of damage, but honestly, this is the easiest way that I can figure out to get it in without breaking down pretty much all of the farm. So I guess you could do this without that and break it down. You could bring a liver on this player right here, but it's not that big of a deal to break a hopper and a composter and then just drop them in like that and you're good to go. With me here, you'll never be lonely. It's so, so clear. So as you see from that time lapse there, we fully built up the overworld side for the new ultimate raid farm by Garlic Bread. Of course, if you don't know already, uh, yeah, Garlic Bread, we have used quite a number of their raid farms in the previous, uh, one of them being Lazy Raid. We also have Kronos and uh, a couple, well, probably a couple other old ones we have on the server. But uh, yeah, this is the newest. Not only is it the fastest, it's also the most lag efficient one. And it's also a bit more TNT efficient uh, in terms of this one, because obviously these fast raid farms use TNT looting, just like the previous lazy looting one, but this one still uses that concept, just it's a lot more lag efficient and obviously much, much easier to build as you can see there, because that was built up in about an hour and a half uh, to an hour and 45 minutes by myself. So yeah, still obviously got to get the whole villagers and everything like that into the farm here, but that is not too bad. Uh, obviously the system I use for the iron farm is going to help out quite a bit. My idea here for this is to bring them all up here and then I will just continue to do them from the top down. So I'll do this one first. The rails going into like that. I think if I stop them on top of that track right there, um, I think it will be enough. They should only pop out there. I will of course obviously just encase it entirely just to guarantee that uh, but i'm pretty sure that is how it should be but yeah that's what my plan is to do that go down to the next one this way this top rail only ever needs to be extended to that path right there and then that path there of course that's going to change when we go up to those ones it'll just be a one-stop shop same thing with that and i think there's one up there as well and we have one down there which i'll probably leave to the last because it's also the simplest one but uh yeah time to lay these tracks down get it all situated and move the villagers in 
it's pretty straightforward, so I don't think we need a full explanation for that. Uh, but yeah, so obviously links to Red and their original farm video showcase and everything like that will be in the description down below. And now it's time to move even more villagers. At least it's not as many as the iron farm that we did previously. Uh, but uh, yeah, I did test the iron farm as well and ran it into this carpet to test it overnight. And it is, uh, yeah, pretty good, especially for it being only one little cell there. Uh, of course, we could tile this more if we wanted to, but I think 10,000 an hour is more than enough than we are going to need, uh, especially different. I'm going to use it for pistons, and we really don't need to craft any more pistons uh, pretty much ever again with new bedrock breakers. But who knows? Maybe for world eaters, things like that, we might need some still. So we should definitely have a way to actually get them. I did mark out an area for a slime farm if we were to do like a single chunk thing. Uh, I don't know if we will, but we can always do that. And we could always just swap out or just make a manual crafting station if you wanted to do that for like sticky pistons, for example, because you're really not going to need that many sticky pistons. Uh, but we could always have it here just in the case. Might add a little bit of a manual auto crafting area there in case somebody wants to do that. Yeah, enough rambling. Get built. We're building the raid farm here. Finish it off. And then we can finish off with the crafter in the center there. All right, so today we are going to be working on the nether side decoration for that that we finished in the last episode there. So this one's going to be that. We're going to have two different types of things inside this perimeter. Uh, we actually mined it out all manual, and then we saw the episode where I showed off that bedrock breaker. I broke the full roof over this. Uh, that way we can have a thing that needs to be above bedrock, and also the thing needs to be below the bedrock. We didn't just do this perimeter for no reason. Uh, we're actually going to have a reason because we're going to have a gold farm down below. That way we can obviously get the barter area as well uh, because we need to get quartz for this perimeter. So two of the components we use a lot of, you know, either observers and the comparators, do need quartz in the recipe. And we want to have this in this perimeter as well, the overworld side, that way we can get Basically everything that we use on a large, uh, you know, things that we use quite often in redstone, we definitely use a lot of observers, that is for sure. So getting the way we can automatically craft them is going to be a huge, huge help. Now don't worry, these walls are not going to be just black concrete. This is just the backdrop because it's going to be a sort of double layer decoration just because the walls look a lot better if they are two layers and just have the black concrete set back by one. Now, technically, we don't need this whole wall to be black concrete, but with ease of building, it's definitely going to be a lot easier just to have a full wall. And it's not like black concrete is hard to come by. So, uh, yeah, this one's mined all the way down to bedrock here. Um, then I'm also working on the walls right now because it's early in the morning. So that way I can sort of, you know, wake up a little bit. not have to worry about, you know, placing the correct pattern for the floor and things like that which uh, one of the other server members did start to work on. Uh, but yeah, once these walls, these back walls are done, I'll probably start doing the floor. That way, you know, everything's all separated from the main terrain. We are going to stop at the top of the bedrock here. So the pattern actually goes a little bit above that. But what I'm hoping to do is that I can sort of stretch it to go back towards the bedrock. And it'd be a little bit difficult to do, especially in the corners. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to do for that part as of right now, but when the time comes, we will see how it turns out. So yeah, the plan here is to sort of keep it the same way as the blaze, but I don't want to have uh, this sort of pattern. You can't even see on the map because it makes the bottom part. So I'll probably have to duplicate it on the floor as well. Uh, that way we can sort of make it seen from the map here. But go back over to the blaze area here. We'll see what I did here. I just have like a randomized pattern of the blocks used. I want to avoid that and maybe try to incorporate the wall into the the top of the wall there. That way it also looks good as well and ties it in that way it doesn't look too separated from it. Well, yeah, I'm probably going to get around, you know, over the million black concrete place in this world, which will be pretty crazy if I'm the only one continuing to work on this wall decoration here. Uh, hopefully some other members get on that way they can help with the floor. Once this is all done, we'll probably work 
on the nether side of the raid farm first, then on the gold farm. That way we can position the gold farm and not interfere, uh, you know, with everything like that. Then maybe the barter areas. We'll see how much we can get done inside of this episode here. Um, I'm hoping we get everything done in one episode. That'd be pretty big. But of course, you know, only time will will tell. But yeah, back to the grind on this stuff. Get all the black concrete in first, and I'll work on the floor. And we'll start to see what the whole area will look like in the end. All right, so we have the floor all finished up here. I basically did the full floor by myself today. Uh, you know, one project that I can do is just do some mindless things sometimes. It's always good to do that rather than building like a farm or things like that. That tend to take up a, a lot of brain power and focus and things like that. Sometimes it's good to just not worry about a lot of stuff, put on a movie or, you know, a series, things like that on the second monitor and just go back and forth placing some blocks and you know go from there but uh yeah so here we have the full floor and the wall uh this wall goes up to the bedrock here what i'm going to try to do is link it up over there but we'll see how like i said before how that's going to end up so it's be a bit difficult to try to do that but i'm going to try my best to do so but yeah, with this we'll have to see how this part goes here uh it'll be a little weird with the black concrete but also, the glass will be also a little bit difficult, but maybe we can just put a black concrete uh, slab beneath there. It should be good to go, but I'll leave that till the end once we have all four walls in. That way I can sort of start to experiment with it a little bit. Uh, but yeah, so I'm actually going to have to glass the whole floor too at some point, which we'll leave for a little bit later down the line. Uh, but yeah, once we come back, we should have basically the full nether decoration here. This gives you sort of an idea of what the four walls are going to look like. And I think this pattern is a really cool one um, to do on the floor. Sort of complements that in a way. I changed the color palette up to what it was originally. It was a bit lighter uh, and stuff like that. So I sort of just changed it to make it a bit darker. That way it blends in with the darker wall uh, just as well. The whole point of this black concrete here is to make room for the glass that we have there on the first layer and then this is the back part of it it makes it look a lot better than if we were to have the black concrete at the same layer as the everything else you know the uh work blocks and the blackstone having it set back one block makes it look a whole lot better so it's definitely worth it now yes we don't technically need all the concrete there because most of it's covered up by the other blocks but Imagine building something like that. It's just a lot easier just to fill the whole thing in. But yeah, the floors in looks really, really nice, especially on the map here. Yes, it's just a repeated pattern, but it still looks pretty good. Uh, really hard to make, you know, like one thing here with the, we'll go through the other perimeters here where we have, you know, the full mob art. We can't really do that with this perimeter all too easily because we have a raid farm and a gold farm and a barter farm. It would be a bit too chaotic. So we're just going for the repeatable pattern with this one here. But uh, yeah, so we're back once this area is fully decorated and on to the farms. All right, so we have finished the full decoration here. And now basically all the walls are in up until the bedrock layer right here. You can see I started to work on some things, planning some things out with the top bedrock here. That way it kind of just wraps up into the bedrock there. Um, but what I need to do is I need to get rid of that one piece of bedrock right there that way I can fit the black concrete to go underneath the uh, deck over here. That way we can still have the glass and make sure it looks a little bit better. Uh, downside is, of course, we need to do some bedrock breaking. Um, I don't like to use the black bedrock breaking too, too much. I actually haven't ever used it before. So I prefer not to so use a zero overhead breaker by a vitamin C here. Uh, one downside for this one that I already planned out here, we'll have to obviously take out some of this, if not all of it, and then we do it again. Uh, but that's not too big of a deal. I'd rather do that than anything else. So this does look pretty cool when it's wrapped around like that. So it kind of just continues into it. And I think it's going to look really, really cool once we get the rest of the bedrock broken and then wrap it up right into the bedrock there. So yeah, using this zero overhead bedrock breaker here by vitamin C, we are able to hopefully do that. I'm going to test it out. I did just schematic verify it, so we should be good to go. And I think this one right here is the switch for it. So we're going to try it out and see if it works. Locks down a little bit, which we're all good. And 
It's a bit slower of a bedrock breaker, but you know the whole goal is that you don't need to have anything uh, like you know extra to break anything. So that looks good. It should start to disappear. This one right here should disappear. Yep, there it goes. It's a bit weird of how it works, but it is a really cool machine, especially that it has zero overhead on the one side, which that means we can run it across here and break the bedrock. Which will then give us space to, of course, put the one piece of black concrete that we need for, just to wrap up the deck and make it smooth and everything like that. Um, so it's a bit overkill, yes, but I feel like this can be automated for most of the part, and I can build the other three on the other sides. And then we only need to worry about this little six block section right here, which can be very easily done with the double uh, break-in method, the manual one there. Uh, but yeah, so really cool no, machine by vitamin C here, of course, to do the slimestone discord will be uh, in the description down below. If you wanted to go use this yourself, you had a similar situation. Or we could actually use this for our void perimeter, but we decided against it because, you know, the walls are going to be Pretty much where these ones are anyway you know it's a little bit more uh we can do just unfortunately for the size of the perimeter we couldn't fit the extra the pattern there so i'll go with this uh, over here as well but uh yeah now it's just time to go build this machine three more times so and we'll be back probably when we have built the arms in the center all right so the full decoration is done and i did also finish building up the ultimate break for the other side that we have, you know, we have the overworld side in the overworld, of course. And we need a nether side processing chamber. Now, yes, we did do something similar with the uh, previous lazy ray. We built a whole perimeter underneath it when it's not actually needed at all. But uh, yeah, we did this with the same thing here, but we're actually going to get a little bit more use out of this, which is what Rubik and I are going to start working on right now. Uh, but yeah, so this way this perimeter is not really, you know, totally useless. Uh, we built the other one just because, you know, I don't like building stuff on top of another roof this late into the game. It feels a bit cheap to me and just like taking the easy way out. This way we kind of get the satisfaction of having it technically inside of a perimeter, even though it is all above the bedrock roof. But still, it just adds that extra wow factor to it rather than just placing it on top of another roof. In my opinion. Of course, you don't need to do this. This is just what I like to do for my survival. So yeah, that's all done. We're going to work on the gold farm now, which is inverted to gold farm. Uh, inverted and Easy Joe, I believe, were the creators of this. So yeah, we're going to build this up. So we're going to attach a storage to it, which we'll figure out some way. Uh, but yeah, probably not going to be over this side, but we'll see. Maybe we'll have the loaders and things over here, and then we'll have it over there. Uh, but yeah, we have to build it so far over here because we got kind of unlucky with the area that we had to build this in based off the overworld side portals for everything like that. We were in a soul sand valley, as you can see in the top left here. Uh, we're in a soul sand valley, so that means we can't have the gold farm right dead in the center, which I wanted to do. Uh, we have to have it all the way over here because this is a nether waste. Now we could do it on the same side over here, but unfortunately, uh, this farm is sort of directional, I believe. So, you know, the best place would be right on this side right here, but I believe the farm is directional. Before we start building it though, I should ask the creator just in case. Um, but with that sign there at the bottom, uh, with it saying, you know, north, south, I believe it would have to be chunk or it has to be chunk light. I know that part, which we are. Um, but I don't know if it's directional. If it's not directional, I can rotate it and then put it on that side. We have it mostly in the center, but, uh, yeah. This is what we're going to do left. And once this is done, this, as far as I know, will be the whole other side uh, of this perimeter completed there. So, yeah, enough rambling. I'll come back once everything is fully done. We've got to glass the floor too, so we'll do that once this area is built up. All right, so if you actually are building this schematic yourself and you're uh, kind of confused on how to get this headless piston right here, I'm going to show you a very simple way that you can do it. It does, of course, use the lag method, but uh, this is the easiest way I've found that doesn't include any explosions. That way you don't have to, uh, you know, worry about all this other stuff with, you know, break-in and things like that. So 
If you wanted to, you could do the explosion first and then build around it by make sure you keep this piston powered, for example. Otherwise, if you would place blocks next to it, it would then update itself. I would think this mag even has redstone block in it. So as long as you keep that there, you should be all good to go. We're gonna do place the sticky piston upwards first. And because for us, we already have a piece of bedrock underneath this packed ice, we don't need to put anything immovable underneath there. But if you didn't, you need to put like a CD or something like that. Uh, that way it can't push down in a sense. So first we're gonna push it straight up with the powered torch. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna go over here, fast right click this lever right here a few seconds. Go back over. That, put it down and power it. And then once the lever stops flicking over there, we will get our headless piston right and then in there. So yeah, very uh, simple thing to do. Make sure we keep that thing powered that way. Any block at least we cause to it actually uh do anything but yeah just wanted to show that off just in case you were to build this thing yourself and that is how you get that headless piston there uh very very easily without any explosions and things like that even on a very uh well developed server where we have a really good performance mods and things like that to sort of nullify this uh with the mojang's current iteration of redstone dust yeah, it doesn't really stop anything from happening. If you did that for too, too long, the server would end up crashing. Uh, this, this is also used for bedrock breaking as well, but with this, we can use it for the headless piston, which is used to separate the XP uh, from the items there. All right, so the gold farm is fully built up here. Everything is all done. And I also did add some stuff onto the back for in terms of storage. So for this one over here, we're actually just going to we're just going to uh, package the gold ingots that we get from the farm itself, because it is TNT Luden. We're going to just package that right into a shulker box there with this 6x loader. It's highly overkill, but this is so that we can get all the gold ingots no matter what kind of uh, you know cooldown they come in from. It's pretty much the same amount same amount of effort as building up a 2x loader. So you know this is a minimum pre full one, so it's also really easy even to do filters. We only need about to fill up these two hoppers right here. So this one I'm sitting on and the one beneath it is the only thing we need to ever fill up with this loader. Which means if you really needed to, you need a stack and one. That's all you need to do to fill up these loaders here, which is pretty, pretty, pretty cool. And then, yeah, for the gold nuggets, we're going to be using a 6x crafter by Z Louch. A uh, very old crafter, but it is going to serve its purpose for us. And there's no need for us to uh, craft them into gold blocks as well. So we're just crafting them right into gold ingots with this 6x crafter uh, and then just loading it into shulker boxes with these four loaders down here. Just simple 2x, nothing too, nothing too, too fancy here. Uh, these produce about 6,000 an hour output, so 2x works for both of them. Uh, a bit less hoppers than having to, you know, go all the way around for just a, like a 6x thing. Uh, and obviously it fits in our required area. That's all done. I'm going to have to link up a dropper stream uh i don't know what i'm gonna do for transportation but maybe we'll see what we're gonna do is probably gonna end up going around this way actually this over here because the input for the barter area we're gonna build is over here so probably gonna go around here come back this way then try to go underneath this here and then go up here uh that's probably what i'm gonna do but i don't know for sure yet but i'm trying to keep it you know as concealed as possible that way it's not you know just over there in the middle of the area and stuff like that and we can't go too much lower with the transport because, of course, we have bedrock and things like that right beneath us. So we will see uh, what I come up with there. But uh, yeah, I have this pingling catcher in the back here I'm going to actually use very, very soon. Uh, that way we can obviously get a bunch. We only need 60. Uh, I'm not going to overkill. I'm actually using the same uh, piglin barter and thing that we've used before uh, by Ive. Uh, that's mainly because it's super compact, lag efficient, and we can take the drops from it straight into the overworld side, which is really, really cool. Uh, and these portal locations right here will go a little bit further on the overworld side for that. Uh, that way we can just drop it into a water stream, which is right over. It's it basically right above a water stream that we have from other farms going into the crafter, which is this main portal right here. Uh, with that, that allows us to just, you know, drop it into the main storage and go from there. Um, the only thing we're going to, have to take out of that is we're going to have to have a shortcut box loader 
just for the quartz. We really only need the quartz to craft observers and comparators, so there's really no need for us to keep anything else from this uh, bar area in this area, to be honest with you. If we do, there's not going to be anywhere for us to store it inside of the crafter UI, so there's really no no point to do that. But uh, yeah, it's a slight modification. I'm just changing some things up. That way I can make it look a little bit better from this side here. Uh, you know, all and all switch in the back and stuff like that. That's all I really modified with this. Uh, and then I have the, you know, the different location for the, uh, you could suspend the initial crew boxes. That's just to hide it from this front area over here. That way you get a like clean UI. So the input will be right here. And then the shortcut box empty output will be right there. Uh, I don't really care that we, if we don't collect all the shulker boxes, uh, but it would be nice to then have to take them back over there. So maybe I input something as well to sort of take the stuff from here and throw it over there as well. But we shall see. Now it's going to capture about 60 piglins with this because we need 60 for that. And this actually will give us a perfect amount to keep up with the amount of gold this produces in terms of ingot form. Uh, probably a little bit extra, but I'd rather have extra than have less. So over time, we might get a little bit of a backup. But I mean, I think that's perfectly fine. Then we run it short and not be able to run it at full speed that we possibly could. This old barter area by Ive, uh, it's still pretty good for its time. And obviously, it's very simple to do. And not much effort needs to be done on the other side, which keeps this area look a lot cleaner and stuff like that. But yeah, enough rambling, we shall go from there. All right, so a bit more time later, and we actually use this perimeter quite a bit. We've even put the slime farm in, like I said, we have a stop up stop there to for the light updates for the tree farm to work properly. Uh, we kind of have to use a solid block and we can't use like glass or anything like that. So we want the slabs all the way up, roll them in that way, it's sort of is somewhat not noticeable, so shivers going down and around. You're not going to notice that most of the time, unless you decide to look all the way straight up. Uh, but then we have the main crafting system in here that Dazi helped a lot with. So a big thank you to them. This has crafted a lot of stuff so far, and definitely uh, for our use case works better than a normal uh, mass crafter would, like Anders and stuff like that. But yeah, everything is all done here. We have everything needed to basically craft a majority of the redstone components in this area with an encoded crafter. Now, yes, we could also craft the other ones. Now, yes, technically we do almost get like everything needed to craft all of them, but we can't really encode all of them within a single encoder. So if you need to craft something like sticky pistons, for example, with the slime over here, we can just get the pistons and put slime balls manually and do it like that. I didn't want to add a manual box uh you know crafter here i wanted to at least you know some way to get out because we do need to turn on some of the farms as an actual player like the stone farm could actually get to put a player there um and the same thing would actually get in a player within reach of the mob farm to spawn that stuff the full floor is glassed obviously that way everything is all good there so nothing can spawn in this entire perimeter besides where we wanted to of course, I had to also incorporate an on-off switch for the slime farm, which is just easily dispensed with water here. Basically, it covers all the pads. That way, nothing is spawnable uh, unless you were to retract some water with the dispensers in the floor there. Uh, obviously, not optimized whatsoever. It was just to get a little bit of slime, and I think it's gotten like 100k uh, so far. Yeah, a little bit around 100,000, actually, uh, just stored up there from that little one chunk not even Y0 slime farm. Uh, but yeah, three farms have been ran a lot. Everything's basically been ran a boatload. We actually crafted a lot of stuff too. Some things are actually already empty again. You can see the torches. Uh, quartz isn't all the way. I just checked that. We have a little bit over 200 some thousand quartz just from the barter area alone. Sticks are also things you use to craft a lot of said torches. Uh, droppers are really kind of hard to fill up. A large quantity but i think there's still plenty down there actually there is none so definitely don't want to use any of those to craft dropper or dispensers but a full shortcut box of dispensers will last quite a while so i don't see us refilling on that anytime soon got a bit of string as well and it's good to note that these lamps are uh based off the fourth chest so they won't turn on until there's an item up there, which is roughly, roughly 400,000 items uh, at the very least where those buffers are, which is pretty good uh, for any indicator and stuff like that. 
But, uh, yeah. What we're going to do right now to end the episode off is actually show this crafter in action because we do need some observers and we really don't have a lot, which is why I was actually checking the courts and stuff there. So what we do here at the main UI is we have three different things. One of them is the instructions. If you can just pause here to read this if you wanted to do so. And then on the left, we want to craft select how many boxes we want. So these are kind of like the breakdowns of the actual boxes. Since some recipes are not one to one, so you can see torches is one to four, rails are one to six, sticks are one to 18, and planks are one to 36. That's just based off how many boxes actually get dispensed per that. So for us, what we're gonna do is craft the nine boxes of observers. We have plenty to do so. Then we're gonna select our component over here. So I think it's all the way at the start. Yep, there we go, page three. And then once we're ready to press that, we can do that. This is basically just a lamp indicator if any ingredient out of any of these is missing. So that'll more than likely always be on for us just because of that. And then this lever here will pause the crafter already. And then down here, you'll have your items or your spot to put your items in your inventory that we don't get that mixed up if you don't want to. And it's a manual box loader. So we basically go down there and click and load it. And then once it's filled, it'll uh, clear itself out. Let me just see if the buffer is completely empty. It should be. Good, good. Doesn't really matter that much if there's a box in there. It just gets like one anyway. This is what this blue block here is to do. That will just basically uh, dispense said one leftover box there because of hopper locking and things like that. So yeah, we're ready. Click that on there. That'll start the dispensing. We're going to stand right up against this. And... In a few seconds, we'll be to dispense that. I have everything all set up within there, so we're all going to do is hold Control, uh, Alt, and C. You can see the boxes getting dispensed there, getting batched, ready to go. Pushed over, they clip the fire, break there, and then get sent on their way up to us, where we are just going to hold and craft the observers here. Now that's all good. Go back over here, pop it in, and then the next batch is already ready to go. So yes, it's not fully AFK, which some people may not like, but I fully like this because it's a lot more uh, lag friendly. You don't got to wait for the box to fill anymore. A couple clicks and you got the box all good to go. And you can very easily keep up without even needing to use mass craft hold uh, because auto crafting table and mass craft hold kind of do conflict each other. So we can't really hold it. As you can see, I'm pressing the hotkey every time. Um, so it still can handle itself and not lag the server which is good for us with auto crafting table. If we didn't have this, this would be a much easier system uh, to just AFK, but for our use case, it's really not the best to do so, but uh, yeah, just the time, you know, we're going to be able to fill craft one of them, put it in a shulker box, the next batch is already here. So I'm perfectly okay with this, much better for our use case for sure. And I think that's already all nine, which is kind of crazy how fast that was. And they should be making their way into the bulk slice over here, which they go up, get sorted by a yet another box sorter here. That was going to go in there. And yeah, we have two different bulk slices here. So majority, I think it's almost a million per slice here, which is kind of crazy. Definitely not needed on this side for sure, unless we're crafting a bunch of like, you know, uh, planks and sticks and stuff like that. But rather have more than not enough. So there we go. All of our nine boxes of uh, observers are good to go. And yeah, we can do the same thing for different recipe for one or two, um, but I don't really think we need to do anything right now. We have the main controls here if we wanted to do so uh, for all the farms and uh, stuff like that. But yeah, most of the time <laughs> it's sort of just nicer to go to the farm and turn it on yourself. But overall, I love this area turned out. Definitely with the encoded uh, decoration as well. Made this project a, a lot easier uh, to do. And then we have all the water streams and things like that connected to the main storage from all the farms. And then this is our barter output here uh, to go into said storage where we just sort out the string and the quartz. I did kind of forget that you actually do get string from bartering. So we actually have two sources of string. So you could modify this to just be creepers only, but it'd be a lot more typical to do so. And you would lose out a lot of spawning spaces. So I don't really think it's worth it. Plus you get a lot more string for that per hour than you would for the barter. And 
Uh, but yeah, the other side's also all completed and good to go. We ran that quite a bit, actually, especially for the amount of quartz that we have stored up here. Um, you need a lot for the observers, and you don't get that much uh, with the speed we have over here. But uh, yeah, overall, this area turned out really, really good. So if you want to see any of these farms actually working, I definitely think you should check out the World Tour video for the three-year anniversary. We show every single farm in this area all running, especially the raid farm up there. One of the favorite ones there. So this one sorts out all the gold and we usually get some uh, ingots in the back. And then we also compact it into shulker boxes to then send its way over to the barter station immediately. And of course, with the smaller ones, we actually craft them into gold ingots first before they get sent over. That way we get a lot more stuff bartered automatically before needing to do anything whatsoever. But uh, yeah, definitely very happy with everything in this area because it's going to get used quite a bit. Uh, but uh, yeah, and this episode is episode 100. If you haven't saw it by the thumbnail and thumbnail, this has been 100 episodes of the Autocraft series so far. Definitely when I started this, I did not think we would get anywhere near this amount of episodes, especially still be going and have so many projects still to go. Uh, we want to go in and do definitely not something i could have ever imagined so thank you guys for all the support and i'm hoping to continue to go with the series even further down the line so yeah make sure to like subscribe all sorts of things and i'll see you in the next one